put on this computer. Cool. Well, thank you all for uh, coming to our um, April meeting of our North Houston Space Society. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, so this is the first time we're trying online and uh, uh, be interesting to see how it goes. So um, our plans are, I was gonna spend a few minutes just with some opening comments and I'll pass it over to uh, Greg um, who will update us on recent space news. And then uh, we'll spend the bulk of the time with uh, Vicky uh, who uh, worked on the ISS food systems um, was the ISS food system manager, and I uh, can tell us about uh, what it's like uh, preparing food for people in space and um, everything that goes into that. And we'll have plenty of time at the end uh, for any type of uh, questions and uh, open discussion. Uh, so, you know, the, the vision of the National Space Society is having people living and working in thriving communities uh, beyond the Earth. And um, you know, using the, the vast resources of space to, uh, for the dramatic benefit, uh, betterment of humanity. Uh, so Jeff Bezos uh, has been, you know, has a space company, uh, Blue Origin, as well as uh, Amazon. And he says, uh, you know, Earth is for living and space is for working. It's kind of like the, the vision that he has of the future of essentially moving heavy industry and uh, mining and power generation off of the Earth into space to kind of protect the earth, which is uh, definitely the most um, uh, special place in the entire solar system and uh, just right for uh, humanity. So uh, we should, uh, now that we have the beginnings of the capabilities of actually protecting it by moving those things into space, we should. And so, you know, if you share this vision, I would definitely encourage you to do two things. Uh, one is you might, uh, you should join our mailing list, which you can do by going to uh, northhoustonspace.org. And on the uh, left-hand side, you can um, subscribe to our, our mailing list so you find out about other meetings like this. And then we also try to uh, send regular updates about other things happening in the community and uh, space uh, news and that type of thing. Uh, the second thing I would encourage you doing is uh, actually join the National Space Society. So you can click on the join now uh, link also on our website. That'll take you over to the National Space Society's website where you can uh, become a member. Um, and that's uh, a good first step to participating in projects and um, community outreach and um, self-education and other things. So I definitely uh, recommend doing those two things. So I just wanted to let you know this meeting is being recorded and uh, we plan to post it on uh, YouTube, uh, our website, Facebook, and other things. Uh, and uh, also about Zoom, um, by default, uh, everybody who comes in the meeting is muted and the video is not started. Uh, that way, uh, no surprises and to try to um, ensure that, um, you know, we minimize background uh, noise uh, as much as possible. But highly encourage everybody to start their video. And then um, if you have a question, um, unmute yourself and then it'd be good if you can mute yourself back uh, afterwards just to avoid any background noise. And then also um, there's uh, a little chat icon and right now um, you can chat with everybody and with the hosts. Um, so uh, feel free to use that. And uh, with that, I pass it over to uh, Greg. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me share my screen here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how do I do the entire screen or show all of this? Uh, hmm. This may, I have two monitors. I'm not sure if it's going to show everything or just one. What, what do you see right now? I can't tell what. Um, I see a, a blink. I mean, I just see your, your desktop uh, with oh, okay. like uh, Google Slides and uh, Qt FTP and, you know, a, a variety of icons. So. And now I see like the presenter's view of the uh, right. slides. Cool. Okay. So now I think. I think we're probably ready. Looks good? Looks good. Okay, so news is space related. Um, 
Well, the first one, I'll start right off with uh, OneWeb. And we had talked about them back in our June meeting where we talked about the various uh, satellite constellations going up for satellite-based internet. Um, mainly, you know, SpaceX with their Starlink project is the biggest one. There's others like Telesat and OneWeb is one of them. They just launched on March 21st, they launched 34 satellites, which takes them up to 74 total. Um, this picture here on, on the left is just sort of a visualization. I'm not sure how well that comes through, but there's, you know, all those little dots there are the satellites and what that would look like. They were going for global coverage, including the, the poles and everything. Uh, their satellites look like this picture on the right hand side. So that was sort of the good news. Uh, the bad news is a week later they filed for bankruptcy. So, you know, they're, obviously they're in trouble. Um, they're not the first. Um, Iridium had done that, Orbcom, Global Star, Teledesic, Skybridge, all of these are names of former companies that were putting up satellite uh, constellations. Uh, they specifically blame COVID-19 for their delays. Um, they were looking for about $7.5 billion in financing for their, you know, their next round to put up the rest of the satellites. So you probably all thought you could avoid hearing about the coronavirus. Well, you, you can't even hear. Now, though they blamed it on that, the reality was they were kind of shaky anyway. They're probably doomed. You know, part of their problem was they had much higher cost launches. Uh, Star, again, Starlink in particular. I mean, Starlink is, is the lowest cost provider there by far. Um, and also they had a different architecture which required the building of a lot of ground stations, unlike Starlink. So, it's a little bit different. And also they don't have deep pockets. You know, another competitor is Amazon's Project Kuiper, which I'm not sure where that really stands, but at least funding isn't likely to be an issue for them. Um, and they didn't have anything going on already. Actually, all those other companies, including Iridium, Orbcom, and Globalstar that have gone bankrupt in the past had come back. Um, and in fact, do have, you know, fairly stable business. Uh, you know, they have cash coming in, so they didn't have these problems. And their other problem was, their major backers, uh, one of them, the biggest one was, uh, you know, is a, a venture firm called SoftBank, and they had all kinds of cash flow problems going on right now. So they've they've kind of pulled out, and that that doomed them. So that's sort of the bad news. But in the long long run, the big picture, you know, they may well reemerge. Somebody else will buy them out, or at least their assets will probably get used. Elon Musk had a comment about that, and I found he's good for comments on about almost everything. Um, he said, guess how many constellations didn't go bankrupt? Zero. It'd be a big step to have more than zero in the not bankrupt category. So that's what he's, he's hoping, of course, that he'll be the first one that doesn't actually go bankrupt in the process here. Okay, so then on a related note then, Starlink, um, what's going on with them? Um, actually, back in June, when we last talked about this, they had just applied to the FCC for licenses um, for, for ground state, well, actually for customer terminals, which is, you know, what people would use to, to access the internet. Um, they applied for a million. They just got that license in this, in this last month. So they got that. Now, kind of the big news in this area was everybody had assumed that they were going to get something pretty much the size and shape of a pizza box as their antenna. And no, that's not what they're doing. Elon Musk, his direct quote is now, it's going to look like a thin, flat, round UFO on a stick. Now, no picture has been provided. So people have come up with all kinds of uh, their own crazy ideas of what this might look like. And that's their attempt at that. Um, but what they did reveal is that it will have a couple motors to adjust the uh, thing to an optimal angle. Now, they're not going to be able to track individual satellites, probably, with that. They're still going, they have this thing called a phased array antenna is the heart of it, which is still, but there, there's an optimizing it in terms of, for instance, if, you, you know, if you're, you're putting this thing on your RV and you're parked out amidst, amidst a whole bunch of trees, probably there's a way to aim it so that at least you're minimizing the, uh, you know, the blockage from the trees. And so, I think it's more oriented toward doing that as opposed to trying to track an individual satellite. That would just go too fast. You may have a, what, seven minutes or something when it's in your field of view. Um, and once again, another Elon Musk quote, he, he put out instructions in a tweet and he said, the instructions are plug, in the, plug it into a socket, point it at the sky. It works in either order and no turnings required. Try, the idea is it's supposed to be very simple. Um, the, I, I still don't think they've re revealed pricing yet. So it remains to be seen what it will look like or how much it will cost, but at least they're, they're moving along and they have approval at least. Um, other space related news related to SpaceX, but not Starlink. Um, sort of another good news, bad news kind of a story. NASA did select SpaceX which provide transportation service to the Lunar Gateway. Okay, the Artemis project is the one that's gonna take us to the moon. Um, that's the NASA program for going to the moon. The Lunar Gateway, 
which is the, the thing on the left-hand side of this, uh, this graphic here, um, that was going to be an orbiter in, in lunar orbit. And the idea is that uh, anybody going to the moon would go to this first, and then there would be a, a lander that goes you know, to and from um, Winter Gateway. And, and then so the, the other parts of this picture, by the way, are this thing in the lower right-hand corner. I think that's probably the uh, Orion Space Capsule, which is the other uh, NASA portion of this thing. And it would, you can see they have a place where it would dock. You know, there's the docking ring right there, where they would dock with, you know, with this lunar orbiter. Um, but they wanted to have something in there for, for SpaceX, so they, they've given them a contract to provide cargo, not, not passengers, but cargo. That would be this uh, those little bluish this bluish device here, um, looks like that. That's a new thing. They just revealed that. So that's all kind of the, the good news about things moving forward. The bad thing is also in this last month, the gateway was officially, and this is sort of in quotes, is that they were removed from the critical path for a 2024 landing. Um, it was always pretty iffy if they'd actually be able to make it by 2024. And now that they've quote removed it from the critical path, that Kind of makes you wonder if it'll ever get built. Um, and so what the way NASA is selling it now is they're saying, well, the, we still need the Lunar Gateway for a sustainable operations to the moon, but the, any short-term visits are really going back to the old flags and footprints kind of thing where you just land somebody and a little while and bring them back for, for near term if we're going to get there by 2024. Um, I guess the cynic in me anyway would say, well, the, re the real issue is that Boeing doesn't have any part in either the Gateway, uh, well, I'm sorry, they only have a part in the Gateway and in the Orion spacecraft. They have no part in, okay, let me say this again, they don't have any stake in the Lunar Gateway, so their projects are now proposing just not doing that, and just pretty much going to the moon. So, you know, the good news is SpaceX got this uh, contract, the bad news is that they may never actually have any reason to do it. So we'll have to see what happens there. Um, other space-related news, uh, there's a project I'd never heard of until recently called the Space Fence. It's been in progress for three or four years. Uh, it finally is finished. This is a drawing of you know, what it's supposed to look like. It doesn't look like much. Um, it's sitting on an atoll in the Marshall Islands, um, interestingly, which is pretty much at sea level. So if uh, actually if sea levels do rise, the thing will probably get flooded. But its purpose is for tracking satellites and space debris. You know, and that's that's well recognized as a major problem, and this is the you know the answer to do that. So the radar station, the radar itself is actually again it's another one of these synthetic aperture kinds where it's all just there's no, no moving parts to it. It's all just hidden inside these buildings, um, and they'll be tracking pieces of of stuff up in orbit. In low Earth orbit, they can track things the size of a marble. I should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. If you happen to lose your marbles while in low Earth orbit, don't worry, they'll be able to track them. And of course, you can't avoid COVID these days. So it turned out it is having an impact on everything space related, just like it's having an impact on everything else. Um, we already talked about OneWeb filing for bankruptcy. Uh, the European Space Agency has delayed four launches. Rocket Lab has postponed one. They're the New Zealand company launching uh, smaller payloads. Um, one that surprised me is Bigelow Aerospace. They're the people that are putting, you know, that are they want to build the inflatable hotels. They actually have, they actually have something attached to the space station, kind of a test mode right now. And they were at, they were asked to bid on some other ones, which would be, you know, residing near the space station but not actually on it. Um, but they went ahead and laid off all their employees. And the future is very unclear. Now, to some extent, you know, very short term, maybe that's just so they can file for unemployment compensation, but it seemed like it was more than that. So that basically, the, the future is very unclear. Uh, investors in general are pulling back on small companies, so that's become a concern. Now, one example you may or may not have heard of was Leo Aerospace. They were doing really uh, small launch vehicles, launching payloads like 25 kilograms, um, you know, up into low Earth orbit. They are officially just going into hibernation. And I'm not quite sure what that means, but it, it does mean that they're just trying to kind of hang out and not spend very much money doing anything. Um, in terms of bigger projects, there are delays in the uh, space launch system testing, uh, James Webb to Space Telescope and some other things. And like everybody, of course, conferences are canceled. Almost everybody works at home and you know they're uh, using video conferencing like we are.
So we have a traditional part of this is uh, how many launches you think we've had since the last meeting. And I was going to suggest this might be a time for people to experiment with, uh, you know, playing with uh, the chat. If you uh, type in a chat, or you can maybe you can put in your guess there. And um, Nathan, are you letting people see the chat? I think I noticed. Yeah, when Stuart put one up before, I noticed everybody got to see it. So that would be very analogous to just the way we did it before, where people said you shot it out numbers. So does anybody want to take some guesses and you can put it on the up there on the chat? Of course, you could just say it if you turn your audio on as well. So it's like uh, Vito uh, is guessing 10. I don't see any guesses. Uh, one, uh, Vito says uh, 10 in the chat. Okay. Do I hear any other guesses? Okay, we can even give some clues. We could say, oh, you're slightly high. Oh, and uh, Stephen says maybe five. And you're slightly low. Narrowing in. Okay, well, I guess that's all the guesses we're going to get. Um, it, the answer is eight. The correct answer is eight. Um, the eight of them looks like, uh, I guess, four of them or three of them were US related, um, three Chinese, two Russian in terms of launches. Now, just because they're launched, say, from Russia, I mean, in many cases, that might have been for a European or American company. Um, and an example of that would be actually that launch of the OneWeb one satellites. Um, that was actually from, you know, Cosmodome in uh, Russia, Kazakhstan. So we had eight. So space is still going on, although, as I mentioned before, some launches have been postponed, like the uh, European Space Agency ones. Okay, uh, next we'll move on to, well, actually, does anybody have any other news they want to talk about or any comments about the news so far? Well, uh, you know, SpaceX has been um, working on their uh, Starship in Boca Chica and, um, you know, they're rapidly building tanks and uh, prototypes and they've gone to naming them like SN1, SN2, SN3 uh, for like serial number um, and they're planning to keep turning them out. Anyway, uh, last night, sadly, SN3 was undergoing a cryogenic test and um, kind of uh, failed, so uh, exploded. Um, so that's uh, unfortunate, but um, you know, uh, still moving on. Hopefully we'll have better news next month. Yeah. So I have one, this is Dave Sharon. NASA released its plan for sustainable lunar operations, I think a couple of days ago. Sorry, what? NASA released its plan for sustainable oh. lunar operations this week. Oh, and, okay, that's good. And uh, David, you have, uh, you know, you were uh, one of the uh, writers for the evolvable lunar architecture. Um, do you see any, um, like, relation between the plan that they had and, and what you had put together? And what are your thoughts about it? Well, it doesn't look like they're going too much along the lines of the plan, but I haven't had a chance to read the document. I just got it yesterday, late yesterday afternoon. Well, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on it. Maybe, um, uh, maybe you could put something together for our May meeting. Okay, yeah. And uh, one other maybe announcement is that, of course, out of all the cancellations, our space settlement design competition was canceled. It was scheduled for the 27th through the 29th at Johnson Space Center last month. However, we are going to plan a virtual space settlement design competition starting April 18th. So um, if you have high school students that want to participate, we might be able to get them in if there's room. And we may also go ahead and try to do a space settlement entrepreneur competition for college students or perhaps even like last year, a mix of college and high school uh, in parallel with that. That's yet being decided whether we're going to attempt that this time. Okay, any other comments? All right, I guess we're ready to move on to our main speaker then. Vicky, uh, are you there? Uh oh. Vicki, you may have to turn on your sound. Yes, I'm here. Uh, okay, great. So um, our speaker is uh, Vicki Claris. Um, 
She has spent 34 years uh, as a NASA manager uh, for space food systems for both the International Space Station and the, the uh, shuttle. She recently did retire. She's the author or co-author of a, a lot of technical publications and received many awards, uh, including actually the highest award you can get from NASA, the Distinguished Service Medal, um, an Exceptional Service Medal twice, uh, accommodation from Johnson Space Center, also an Outstanding Alumni Award from her daughter, um, Texas a and um, She's also been active uh, outside of NASA in the uh, Institute of Food Technologists as a certified food scientist, but more importantly, um, she is on the board of directors of the IFT and is now also now the president-elect, which means she has a three-year term as president starting in September. And then after that, you go into a term of being the ex-president. So she's, she's going to be busy for a while, is what, what it sounds like. Um, education, she had a, a BS in microbiology with a minor in chemistry uh, from Texas a and and also then went on for a master's in food science and technology uh, from Texas a and as well. So I guess with that, it's time to turn this over to Vicki. So Vicki, you'll need to seize, share your screen and seize control of this. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, no. Sorry. You can't? Ah, yes. Yes. No, we can't. Okay. All right. So let me get my slides up. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, I wish that we could be doing this in person. I think it would be more fun, but I'm glad we do have the technology to be able to go ahead and, and do it. So, what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the history of space food quite a bit about the present uh, food system that we are NASA is using on the International Space Station and then a little bit about the future uh, of the future, the research that we're doing for future food systems. So uh, I'm sure you're probably aware of cubes and tubes being the original space food for Mercury and Gemini. Um, the tubes were made, or the cubes were, were dried, things like dried cereal, dried bread products, dried cookies, dried sandwiches. Um, it's interesting, we had a special, when I came to work there in 1985, they still had the piece of equipment that made those cubes in our lab. And uh, eventually it got sent to the Smithsonian. So, uh, I'm sure they have it somewhere, kind of, kind of like you know, it's probably in their basement, kind of like the the Ark of the Covenant is as well, somewhere hidden down there. But it did go to the Smithsonian. It was a very interesting looking piece of equipment. The uh, tube foods were basically baby food, pureed food that they just squeezed into their mouths. So uh, the food did provide the nutrition that they needed, but it was uh, not that aesthetically pleasing. Um, Apollo brought, the big change for Apollo brought in the spoon bowl, which is the package that you see on the bottom here. It was for freeze dried foods. They added water using a handheld water gun, and then they cut the package open at the top and ate out of the package with a spoon. So it was the first that uh, package or first time they'd been allowed to actually use a utensil. So that was during the Apollo program. Then came Skylab. Skylab was actually the most sophisticated food system that NASA has ever flown because it's the only one that has ever included um, frozen food as a core part of the menu. The meal tray that they used, um, they had three trays like this mounted on a pedestal in the lab. And um, the reason it was so sophisticated is because this tray was the oven as well as the dining table. Um, so those three switches that you see on the front there controlled the front three wells. 
And if they had a frozen item, they would put it in one of those wells, flip the corresponding switch, and that's how they heated their frozen food to serving temperature. Um, then came shuttle. Uh, I came to work in August of 1985 as a contractor at the Johnson Space Center. I was working for a company that at that time was called Technology Incorporated but not the TI that everybody thinks about related to calculators, but a different technology incorporated. It changed names shortly after I came there to become Crude Goliath Sciences, then Wiley Labs, and then KBR Wiley, and now KBR because they brought out Wiley Labs. But they are still, that same company is still a um, cornerstone contractor in the life sciences area at the Johnson Space Center. And they are still the prime contractor for the food lab at the Johnson Space Center. So when I came to work about 16, uh, I think 16 of the 135 shuttle flights had flown uh, before I got there. So this is what the packaging system will look like when I arrived on duty. Um, we were using MRE entrees in the thermostabilized pouch. We were using the same entrees that they were making for the military. We were using some limited amount of cans from the commercial market. These were things like Del Monte fruits and puddings and things that were in flip top cans. Um, the red, white, that you see in the center of the screen were for the freeze dried and the beverages. And in the corner of that package, um, you see where the, the corner is blunted, and then there's a hole right next to that blunt. In that hole was, a, was the septum. The septum is a little plastic valve with a slit in it that allows water to be injected into the package using a needle on the rehydration station. So the water would be injected, um, the needle would hold that slit open so that the water could go into the package and then when the needle was withdrawn, the slit would close to prevent the fluid from flowing out of the package. So in the case of beverages, they would use the straw that you see next to the package. It had a rigid tip. They would insert that straw into that septum. It would, that tip would hold the septum open, the slit open so that the fluid could flow up the straw and then they had a clamp on the straw so that in between sips they clamped it closed uh, and the clamp is actually a commercial off-the-shelf uh, IV clamp. In the case of the freeze-dried items they injected the water and then they um, when the water uh, was injected into the package they would then manipulate the package to spread the water throughout the food and once the food was moistened they were able to cut the package open with their scissors and eat out of the package with a fork or a spoon, depending on the product. Once it was wet, the surface tension of the food would tend to hold it attached either to the package or to the utensil. Uh, we also had intermediate moisture items, so like dried fruit, dried beef, that were commercial off the shelf, and numerous uh, natural form products. So we called them natural, we called them natural form, because they fly in their natural form. We do not further process them. These are things like nuts, crackers, cookies, um, candies that we buy commercially in package to send to orbit. These packages, the rigid white packages that you see in the middle of the slide, were designed to be stacked. They nested inside each other. And the crew members were supposed to nest them in the trash, but they never did. Um, they would just chunk them in the trash bag uh, and on the shuttle all the trash came home. So as the number of crew members increased on shuttle and the duration of the flights got longer, these packages were taking up way too much room in the trash. So when Challenger occurred in January of 86 and we were basically down because we weren't providing food for any flights at that time, we were asked to undertake a project to redesign the packages for the beverages and the freeze dried. And so we started that project and it actually took us from um, sometime in probably early 87 all the way to 
1990 to complete uh, that transition. But we had a packaging engineer in our lab, and he designed a what we call the septum adapter assembly. So that is that little white uh, device that you see sticking out of the top of this beverage package. So he designed that little adapter to hold that septum. And so inside that adapter is the same septum that was in the original package. So he, uh, this, this is the, the package he designed and it is still the package that we use for beverages on the International Space Station. This material is the same material that Capri Sun um, used until just recently. Uh, we buy this pouch, it's sealed on three sides, it's open at the top. We take it into a clean room, uh, the, the appropriate quantity of powder for a single serving is weighed into the pack and the packaging equipment that seals this uh, septum adapter into the top of the package. In the case of the beverages, they're still using the same straw that they used previously. For the freeze-dried, uh, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, we transitioned to this package that you see here, which we called our EDO package, Extended Duration Orbiter Package. It was um, designed, it was a two-part um, package. So the base of the package was formed and had no top on it. And then you went through a piece of equipment that sealed, uh, you weighed in the powder to the base or you weighed in the food to the base of the package. Then you had a machine that sealed the top on the package and cut it out. So it cut out the shape, but then you had to put it in a second piece of equipment to seal this septum adapter into the top of the package. So again, the crew members would inject water through the septum and then manipulate the package to distribute the water. And once the, the product was moist, then they would open the package with their scissors and eat out of the package with a fork or a spoon. About two years ago, we, um, we transitioned to this package. Uh, it's called, we call it the gusseted pouch. It has the same sep septum adapter in the top, but it is a one-step process. It's literally a gusseted pouch that the food is weighed into, and then the septum adapter is sealed in the top. Um, the obvious advantage for us on the ground to this is that it's a one-step process rather than a two-step packaging process. Which for the crew is, there's more room. We can actually have larger serving uh, sizes in this package. And that was a complaint that we had gotten from the previous package was that the serving sizes on some of the products were too small because they were restricted by the volume of the package. Um, Thermostabilized foods, as I mentioned, when I came to work there, we were buying entrees from the military and we were using those. Um, when, we, when I first came to work there, I was actually hired primarily to work on the food system for what was going to be Space Station Freedom, the US Space Station. Um, and so in that case, um, we, in the case of Space Station originally, we thought we were gonna have frozen food again. There was gonna be a US habitation module that was gonna include refrigerators and freezers for food. So we were actually beginning to work on planning a frozen and refrigerated packaging system for Space Station. Well, uh, Space Station Freedom went away. It became obvious we were not gonna be able to build a space station on our own. And so at that point, we formed, began forming a consortium to build the International Space Station. And in the mid 90s, when they started looking at how much power they were gonna get from the solar arrays, they quickly figured out they could either have freezers for science or freezers for food. And food lost out, which I can't say, I mean, it should have in this case, because it's important to have refrigerators and freezers for science. And so we were back to an all shelf stable food system. And so at that point, um, the gentleman, Dr. Charles Borland, who was managing the space station food system at that time, um, he was doing that and I was doing shuttle. He, um, 
he talked to the program and he said, if we're not going to have frozen or refrigerated food, we need to start formulating our own thermostabilized food products because the MREs were way too high in salt and fat for what we knew our long duration crew members needed. They were fine for shuttle when the flights were short, but when we knew our crew members were going to be staying up there for first, it was going to be like four and a half months and now it's routinely six months and sometimes even a year. Um, the high salt, high fat, um, even though the military has good reason to have that, it's a negative for us. So in the mid 90s, um, the food scientists in the lab at Johnson Space Center began formulating our own products to, to thermostabilize in pouches. We now have about 50 some odd products that we do custom to send to the International Space Station. And by doing them custom, we can control the salt and fat content. Uh, we still fly intermediate moisture products. We still fly many natural form products. We repackage these products for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that all of these products, whether they be intermediate moisture or natural form, they're dry. And so if you have them in bulk in microgravity, they're going to be very difficult to handle. Um, and so it's much easier for the crew members to handle these products in microgravity if they are portioned out in single serving portions. So that's one of the purposes of repackaging. Further, we're putting them in a pre-approved material um, for the spacecraft environment. So any material that you send in significant quantities into the spacecraft has to be approved and tested for that environment. So it is more cost effective for us to package these items in a pre-approved material than to try to approve all the different manufacturers' packages. Uh, it would be very costly. At the same time that we uh, portion these out and package them, we're also back flushing with nitrogen. And that removes some of the oxygen, not all, but by removing some of the oxygen, we're actually extending the shelf life of these products because oxygen and moisture are the two biggest enemies of food, of, of shelf life when it comes to food. Uh, we also have a small number of meat products that we have that rather than being thermostabilized in a retort, they have been made shelf stable by Did anybody can, else you, just lose sound? Uh, it, my computer has a tendency to auto mute. Don't ask me why, but it does. It yeah, was me. We, we missed, you just started talking about the uh, meat. Uh, radiant. And then, right, and everything else went dead. Okay, so uh, these products are made shelf stable using irradiation rather than uh, a retort. And so uh, we get these made through the military. And the advantage to doing this is that you can do whole pieces of meat. For instance, we have an irradiated beef steak that literally is a small steak that we're able to make shelf stable through irradiation. Uh, you'll notice that when you buy typically canned or pouched meat products, they're going to be cut in chunks. And that's because when you retort, you have to get to make them commercially uh, shelf stable you have to be sure that the heat and the pressure are getting to the center of that meat. And that's why it's difficult to, uh, to retort a whole piece of meat. But in the case of irradiation, you have better penetration, so it's easier to do a whole milk, uh, meat product. Uh, we send condiments. On the shuttle, we used to send an early space station, we would send the individual condiments like you get at the fast food places. The only difference being the salt and pepper. Um, we, the salt and pepper are, are in liquid form. The salt is dissolved in water. The pepper is dissolved in a food grade oil, uh, similar to a cooking oil. 
uh, squeeze a drop and touch it to the food if they want to stir it in. Uh, now on space station, because they're there for a long time, um, we're able to send uh, condiments in bulk now. So we send plastic squeeze bottles of things like mustard, hot sauce, mayonnaise, things like that. Um, so we're, which are much easier to use uh, for them, obviously, than the little individual packets. Each crew member gets their own uh, utensil kit. And that's because we do not have a way on orbit to actually sterilize. Uh, there's no dishwasher, there's no sink, so uh, all they have is wipes to clean these utensils off between uses, and so because of that, we really don't want them to share utensils, so we give them each their own kit. Um, this is a picture of the space station. This was actually taken from one of the last shuttle flights as it was either coming to or leaving station. Um, so this is pretty much assembly complete. Uh, you're probably aware that um, lengthwise, this is probably end zone to end zone on a football field, and the internal volume is about that of a typical three bedroom house. Um, when we first started sending food to space station, space station was very, very small. And so at the time, all of the dining was done in the Russian service module. And the service module was a duplicate. So the Russians had had a service module as part of their Mir space station. And when they got together with us to start building the ISS, they uh, contributed a duplicate of that service module. So the service module was one of the, the Russian service module was one of the very early pieces that went up. And uh, a lot of our food that we were sending to Space Station early on was sent via the Progress. And so in the Progress were uh, our shelves for these boxes that you see here, these food boxes. And so, and next to the dining table in the service module were racks that held these food boxes. And so the first foods that we sent for our crew members to ISS were sent in the boxes that you see here. So uh, this, these are actually photos from Mir, the Mir service launch in Lucid, but it's a close up uh, of the rehydration station that shows you uh, how that looked and how it still looks inside the service module on ISS. Um, they have a dining table in the service module and uh, you can see they have Velcro and elastic straps to help hold the food in place. At that time, the Russians were still using tube foods. Um, they have uh, gave up on using those pretty much when the uh, Soviet Union split up, when it kind of fell apart. Uh, the company that made their tube foods was no longer part of the Soviet Union, so they eliminated that uh, those particular products from their menu. The interesting thing about the Russian food system though is that they still use cans, which surprises me because they're so heavy to launch, and they're not even flip top cans. They have to have a can opener or a hand can opener to crank these open on orbit. When uh, station got bigger and we went to crew of six, they added a second food preparation area in the US segment. At that point, we quit sending food in boxes because uh, we were now uh, dining in the U.S. segment and um, we no longer had, uh, had to, the, to use the, the shelving that required the boxes. And so we started sending food up in what you see here, which we call a bulk overwrap bag or a BOB for short. At NASA, you gotta have acronyms for everything. And so we send up BOBs of food. And just to give you a perspective, this BOB is about 15 inches by 12 inches by a little over five inches deep. So the food that we send to orbit, um, we send what we call pantry style. 
So we have about 200 different foods and beverages that are part of our standard menu that we send to ISS. Uh, we uh, at NASA, the NASA lab is responsible for feeding the NASA astronauts, the ESA astronauts, the JAXA astronauts, and the Canadian astronauts. So they're all eating from the US food supply. And then the Russians are feeding, providing food for their cosmonauts. However, that said, they do trade and share food on orbit because when you're there, the more the variety, the better when you're there for six months. So they do trade food back and forth. Um, um, we have about, like I said, about 200 different foods and beverages that we pack pantry style. So what that means is we pack all the meats together, we pack all the vegetables together, we pack all the fruits together. We have about eight, we have eight different categories of food that we send to orbit. And uh, so on orbit, they're going to have one of each of those eight categories open all the time. And they're going to be assembling their meals real time from those different categories. So they, they don't have to eat the same thing at the same time. They're going to go and pick whatever they want for that particular meal uh, from the supply that's open. Um, so they get real time choice to uh, pick and choose their meals. In addition to the standard menu, uh, each crew member that goes to orbit gets, for a six month stay, they get nine of these bulk overwrap bags that they can use to put preference foods in. So preference foods can be more of our goodies. If they have favorites from our 200 foods and beverages that they want to eat a lot of while they're on orbit, they can put additional ones in their preference containers. Also, they can actually go to the grocery store and they can walk the aisles and look for shelf stable items. Um, as long as they meet our microbiological standards and they have sufficient shelf life and they're not in glass, we can't send anything glass to orbit, um, they can take small quantities of commercial off the shelf items with them. And uh, thirdly, if they are a ESA astronaut, a JAXA astronaut, or a Canadian astronaut, their country can send shelf stable items to our lab in Houston. And the folks in the lab will pack those specialty foods, uh, those uh, foods from their home country, in their preference containers to send to orbit. Um, in addition to those nine preference containers, each crew member will get five additional bobs that are all. Those five additional bobs are to be used for customized beverages. So like if they're coffee drinkers or tea drinkers, they're gonna have to tell us ahead of time, I want my coffee black or I want it with creamer in it or I want it with artificial sweetener, because on orbit, all they can do is add hot water. So we have to pre-package whatever, however they want it. Um, and so that's what those five beverage containers are used for. Um, if a crew member is participating in an experiment that requires a specific menu, sometimes they do, um, then we will pre-pack that. This is an example of, this is a cargo transfer bag that was packed for uh, Mike Fink. Mike Fink was a participant in an experiment called Solo. And that particular experiment was an ESA experiment. But on the days that he participated in that experiment, it would be four days at a time and he was required to eat a very specific, a set menu. And so in order to make it easy for him, we would prepack that menu into this cargo transfer bag so it would be ready and waiting for him when it came time for him to participate in the experiment. So we do that routinely for experiments that require preset or, or specific menus. This is a close up of the rehydration station in the US segment. It has a needle which is permanently mounted. The crew member inserts the septum onto that needle. They dial up the quantity of water. The label tells them how much water to add. 
on station, they choose either ambient water or uh, hot water. They have no chilled water on station. Um, they did have chilled water on shuttle, but not on space station. So if they want a chilled beverage, what they have to do is they have to rehydrate that beverage with ambient water, and then they have to put it in what is called the Merlin. So Merlin is an acronym for Microgravity Experiment Research Locker Slash Incubator. So Merlin, uh, there's several Merlins on board, and it's a refrigerator freezer that was really developed for science, but they repurposed one uh, to allow us to chill beverages. Um, the Merlin is small. It's about the internal volume of a typical home microwave, but it does allow the crew members to chill beverages and to chill fruits, pouches of fruit, if they would like to have those chilled prior to consumption. And they can also store bulk condiments in there. So some of those bulk condiments, in order to be kept microbiologically safe, need to be chilled. And so they're not all of them, but some of them do. And so the Merlin provides them a means to do that. Below the Merlin is the oven that they use to warm their food. This is, um, again, it's about the internal volume of a typical home microwave. It has four vertical heating uh, surfaces with clamps. And so the heating is done by conduction. They actually clamp the food item to the, surf the hot surface and, uh, and that's how it gets warmed up to serving temperature. Uh, this is a picture that was actually taken while the shuttle was still flying, but it's a dining table in the US segment. And I include this picture mainly because uh, you can see the condiments to the side, like the, the bo bottle of sriracha sauce, there's a bottle of pickle relish, I believe, they tend to keep condiments and things handy at the table um, and then uh, prepare the food. And again, the, the uh, elastic and uh, Velcro uh, are used quite extensively to, um, to help restrain the food during dining. And this particular meal, they're eating a lot of Russian food. A little bit of ISA food, the ones that are flip top cans, that's European provided products, but um, most of the cans are not flip top, they're Russian items. Uh, this is a close up of actually our uh, split pea soup. I put this in here just to show that when we formulate things like soups that are more liquidy in nature, we have to make them fairly viscous. They have to be pretty thick so that they can be handled more easily by the crew in microgravity. Uh, we do have a chicken consomme in our menu, but that has to be consumed through a straw. Um, so viscosity is very important in formulating products for microgravity. This is just a close-up of one of our freeze-dried items. It happens to be our freeze-dried tomatoes and artichokes. Um, the products look much better after the water is added. When they're dry, they don't look that appealing, but when you add the water, uh, they're a whole lot uh, more appetizing. Um, tor flour tortillas are by far the most popular bread item uh, for our crew members on space station. We have flown tortillas since shortly after I came to work at NASA. Uh, when um, Right after I came to work there in 1985, uh, Rudolfo Neely, uh, um a payload specialist from Mexico flew on board the shuttle and he requested to take tortillas with him. And he took them in the fresh food locker and when the crew members saw how easy it was to take tortilla and roll it up, and it was like having a sandwich without having to deal with two pieces of bread on orbit. Um, they quickly said, forget the bread that they'd been taking for sandwiches, we want tortillas from now on. So we started uh, procuring uh, fresh tortillas. We actually uh, found a factory here in the Heights. And uh, when the crew left for Florida prior to a shuttle flight that morning, we would go and get fresh flour tortillas off the line. We would uh, send them with the crew on the NASA plane down to Florida. And those were 
packed in plastic bags and sent to orbit for the crew. And those would last about eight to 10 days, which was flying at that time because that's about how long the missions were. But as the shuttle flights got longer, um, the crew members were uh, adamant that they wanted tortillas on day 14 of their flight uh, and the fresh really wouldn't last that long. Typically they would mold before that happened, before they got to day 14. So we developed our, uh, what we call an extended shelf life tortilla in the food lab. Uh, the military routinely has for years made these extended shelf life bread products for uh, the mil for the MREs, for the meals ready to eat, but they were not making tortillas. But we did know the technology that they used to make those uh, ESL bread products. And what they did um, was they packaged these, pro these bread products anaerobically in order to prevent yeast and mold from growing. So by depriving oxygen from the package, you prevented yeast and mold growth. Um, and so you got a very long shelf life. There's always a catch, and the catch was that you couldn't just take any old bread product and package it anaerobically because if you do, you run the risk of anaerobic pathogens growing in the package. So in order to keep that from happening, you put binders in the dough to bind more of the free water. So uh, water activity, in food is a measure of the amount of free water in the food. If you get the water activity below a certain level, no bacteria can grow. They need a certain amount of free water to grow. So we knew the military was making these ESL bread products. They were making things like dinner rolls and uh, cinnamon buns and things like that. They were making them using um, binders and using low water activity. So we developed our own tortilla formulation that was low water activity. We vacuum package it and we were able to get about four months out of that product shelf life, which was more than enough for shuttle flights, but then it would develop a bitter aftertaste. And so the quality would really degrade after four months. And so when we got ready to transition to the International Space Station, we knew we were gonna need a longer than four month shelf life for our tortillas. We were about to start a R&D project in the lab to figure out what was causing that bitter aftertaste so that we could extend the shelf life. And about that time, there was a commercial company that came out with a soft taco kit in the grocery store for making soft tacos. And the tortillas were included. And that on shelf life. So we knew that had to be a low water activity tortilla. So we got samples of it and sure enough tested it. It was low water activity. So we found out who was making it for that company and we started buying those and packaging them in our lab, packaging them anaerobically. We were able to get two years out of those tortillas and so that solved our problem for space station. And so we've been doing that for many, many years in the lab. We were buying those tortillas and packaging them. And about, oh, I don't know, two years ago-ish, we found out that the military had started making an extended, or started developing and making an extended shelf life tortilla for the MREs. And so we contacted the company in San Antonio, it's called Sterling Foods, that has the contract for the MRE breads, and we got samples of their product, and we compared that to our product. And so uh, everybody in the lab gathered around, we tried it. Some of us liked the military one better, some of us liked ours better, some of us couldn't tell a difference. Well, when we investigated, we found out the military really wasn't making them. They were buying them from the same people we'd been buying them from, packaging them and providing them for the MREs. So we're now able to buy our product prepackaged and send it to orbit, and it has a two-year shelf life. The, we never can seem to get too many tortillas to orbit. They're always asking for more. This is a picture inside our lab these are two of our food scientists uh, preparing food to go into the freeze dryer. 
uh, we have two different types of freeze dried products, some that are packaged in blocks. Um, this looks like an ice cube tray, except a little bit bigger than the typical ice cube. So these are products that have, uh, that we package in or freeze dry in blocks so that they uh, come out in a single um, section and they're much easier to package. We also package some products, um, freeze dry them loose and then weigh them into the package. It's a close up of one of the freeze dryers in the lab. This is inside our packaging room. We use a portable clean room uh, with HEPA filters. Uh, we are not like a computer facility. We don't have to operate at a certain clean room level, but by using a clean room and by using a hair nets and face masks and shoe covers and lab coats and gloves, we're able to greatly reduce the potential for any contamination of products during the packaging process. And of course, all of our products that we handle and package, those are tested um, post-packaging uh, to assure that we have not contaminated them during the packaging process. We have sensory booths in our lab. We have uh, volunteers at the Johnson Space Center who come in and participate in sensory evaluations for us. We do sensory, we can do eight test subjects at a time. We do sensory evaluations for a number of reasons. If we're developing a new product, obviously we're gonna want feedback on that product, but uh, we also routinely do sensory analysis on even commercial products that we buy. Uh, we, when we buy a new lot of nuts or crackers or cookies, we're gonna do um, a sensory analysis on them to make sure that um, they, that they uh, are of good quality. Um, our crew members come to our lab to do uh, food sessions to try all of those 200 different foods and beverages that are part of our menu. Um, they'll come about four times at lunch and um, they'll get, at each lunch, they're gonna get about 50 different foods and beverages to try. So obviously they're not consuming a full portion, they're just tasting these products. They're going to score them on a nine point hedonic scale with, um, with one being dislike extremely and nine being like extremely. And those scores and comments that they write down are for us to look at as well, but mainly it's for the crew members to use in deciding which, if any of these standard menu products they would like to put in their crew specific containers. So they're gonna do these food sessions early on and then later, uh, closer to flight, they're gonna come back and meet with us and tell us what they want in their crew specific containers. Um, our retort facility where we make our thermostabilized foods is fully located at Texas A&M University. When we first started doing our own uh, retorted products, our own pouch products, we would uh, go to the uh, MRE facilities and we would rent them for like a week at a time. And our food scientists would go and we would use their technicians and their equipment and we would make all the foods that we needed. And that worked for a while, but then when the war in Iraq, the first war in Iraq came along and persisted for so long, we were unable to get access to MRE facilities. They were making MREs 364 days a year, two shifts a day. So we had to come up with our own facility. We put out uh, what's called a request for proposal and we had various bidders and actually Texas A&M was one of the biddies and they um, won the, the bid. And so in 2007, we partnered with them and opened our retort facility inside their electron beam food processing facility. It's located in the research park at Texas A&M. Uh, this is an inside picture of our facility. They had empty space in their electron beam facility and so that's why they bid to partner with us. We purchased our retort and established it there. Uh, the products are prepared, they're sealed in the pouches. They go inside the retort and the retort uses a combination of heat and pressure 
to make them commercially sterile. Um, so challenges, I want to talk a little bit about our challenges for, about NASA's challenges for a Mars mission food system. So the thing about that first mission to Mars is we're going to have to pre-position all the supplies. The crew cannot take all that stuff with them and we're not going to launch the crew until we verify that what they need is there and waiting for them at either on the surface of Mars or in orbit around Mars. And so what that means is that we're going to prepare food, we're going to put it in a cargo vessel, we're going to launch it to Mars, verify that it's there, and all of that will occur before the crew is ever launched. So what that means is that the food that they eat on the return trip from Mars is going to be somewhere between five and seven years old. So the difference between the five year and seven year extreme is the type of rocket that's used to pre-position the supplies. If a chemical rocket is used to pre-position the supplies, the food will be about five years old on the return trip. If a solar powered rocket is used, that will be a slow boat to Mars. And so the food that they eat on the return trip will be about seven years old. So we can actually prepare food that is safe to eat for five to seven years because we can either by freeze drying or thermostabilization, we can uh, stop the microbiological processes. We can stop the microbes from growing. So we can prepare food that's safe to eat, but the challenge is we cannot stop the chemical changes that occur in those foods. So those chemical changes are going to degrade the nutritional content of the food. They're going to degrade the quality and acceptability of that food. Over time, the color is going to change, the flavor is going to change, the texture is going to change, and not in a good way. So that is the challenge of five to seven year old food, because you want to make sure that you have enough food that's of high enough quality that the crew members are going to continue to eat and eat enough to maintain high performance. The military has done a lot of studies in the field with MREs, and they find that when crew members have been in eating MREs for too long, something called menu fatigue sets in, and they begin to eat enough to survive, but not enough to thrive. So we want the crew on that return trip from Mars to be at top performance. And so we have to prevent menu fatigue. And so that means having enough high quality food, enough variety that they're going to continue to want to eat. So um, we have concerns about di potential dietary restrictions that crew members might have. Potential impact of a, if a crew member gets changed out after we pre-position the food, say there's a medical issue or some other issue that causes the original crew member not to go and a substitution is made, we won't have resupply during the mission and fresh food, any fresh food they had will be limited to what we call pick and eat crops. So we, on Space Station now, they have an experiment called veggie where they can grow things like lettuce. And so um, they, in transit to Mars and potentially on the surface of Mars, they will be able to grow limited quantities of these pick and eat items. So it's gonna be things like lettuce, maybe cherry tomatoes, something like that that doesn't require any processing, but those foods are going to be more, they're gonna have more of a psychological impact to the diet than an actual nutritional impact because the volume of these items will be very small. And of course, for a mission to Mars, we're going to have volume and mass restrictions on the foods that we send. So we have a group in, uh, in the lab at the Johnson Space Center that's called our Advanced Food Technology Group, or AFT. That's our research team. And so they're, uh, they've been doing studies, variety studies, 
to actually look at how much variety do crew members really need to be satisfied um, to feel like they have enough variety in their food system. So they've been using utilizing data, data from ISS crew members that are have been and are currently are on orbit, and they've been utilizing data from um, what's called HERA, our Human Exploration Research Analog, which is a ground-based chamber study that NASA has been doing over the past few years, where they've been putting people in isolation uh, for various periods of time. We've also, the AFT group has also been looking at nutrient degradation, which nutrients have the most potential to degrade, and in which foods are these nutrients more stable. One of the interesting things we've discovered is that, not surprisingly, vitamin C is one of the nutrients that we have to be most concerned about. Just like the sailors during ancient exploration had trouble with vitamin C, it is it degrades very quickly in things like thermostabilized and freeze-dried foods. But the thing that we have discovered is, is very stable in powdered beverages. And so things like Tang, which we still use, and other powdered beverages that are enriched with vitamin C have the potential to um, actually prevent our crew members from having an issue with something like scurvy. So uh, our uh, Crew members on those first mission to Mars may actually have a prescription from the docs that say you're going to have to eat or drink, consume so many of these powdered beverages per week in order to be sure that you get enough vitamin C. Um, more than likely what it's going to take for us to get that five to seven year shelf life is what we call a hurdle approach. So it's going to be a combination of processing technologies and some temperature reduction in the storage of the food. So uh, for every degree you can reduce the storage temperature, you're going to slow down those chemical changes in the food. And so uh, by taking shelf-stable food, so we, we cannot depend on frozen or refrigerated food for a Mars mission. If that refrigerator or freezer were to fail, that food would be uh, unconsumable. It would be unsafe to eat. But if we take shelf-stable food, such as thermos pouch products or freeze-dried products, and we reduce the temperature at which they're stored, we can shorten, we can extend the shelf life by reducing um, the, uh, or slowing the chemical changes in the food. Um, and the, the thing about it is, even if that reduction in storage temperature were to fail, uh, you would still have food that was safe to eat. Even though the nutritional content might not be great and the quality might not be great, you would still not starve. So the hurdle. Uh, lost sound again. Unlike the bars that are marketed on the commercial market, these are true meal replacement bars that would provide a full one third of our crew members daily requirements. Commercial bars out there are uh, not, most of them are around 200, 250 calories. They're, you know, either high protein or low carb or they're, they're not true meal replacement bars. And so work has been done in the lab um, on meal replacement. Okay, I'm going to stop there and see if anyone has any questions. Uh, this is John. I have a question. Uh, you okay. have uh, you, you have you talked about bars. Um, you know, I know we you know going back 50 years we had tang and and you go through a tube and and uh, you know the food has to be contained. Uh, because of the weightlessness of space, and of course now we have MREs. That's that's an improvement. But I don't know if you remember something like Jiffy popcorn. If you could actually take a chicken parts or strips and heat it and and cook it, is that possible? So the problem is that on the space station they actually have nothing 
that can cook. Um, and I will, I will make one caveat on that because there is a private experiment that went up as part of NanoRex that was designed to bake cookies. So that was an actual oven, but it was set up strictly to bake chocolate chip cookies. That's what it was set up for. But all of the, all of the apparatus that they have on orbit for warming food does not get hot enough to cook anything. It's, it's only warming temperatures. And so it's really not an option at this time for them to cook food. And nor does NASA really want the crews to be spending time cooking food. Um, at this point, they're more, uh, they would rather them be spending their time doing science and, and maintenance and things like that on space station. But no, we really don't have the capability to cook food on orbit. Okay, thank you. I had a question. It seems like the, um, I guess the astronauts get to pretty much choose their own foods. Who helps them decide what to pick? For instance, if there's special issues, even you, you mentioned that the high salt and fat are bad. Maybe there's other issues related to bone loss or muscle atrophy and those kinds of things. How, how do you ensure that they're getting what they actually need? So, um, prior, prior to, um, it's all done through the medical side of the house. So they have private medical conferences with their flight surgeons. And uh, now, um, I guess starting maybe three years ago, they actually have an app on Orbit that lets them track what they're eating. And so every package of food that we sent up there has a, a barcode on it. And so when they consume an item, they can either scan the barcode or uh, they can use the app to either scan the barcode or take a picture of the, uh, if it's a commercial product that they've uh, put in their preference container, they can actually take a photo of the, of the nutrition label on that product. So they're able in real time using this app to track what they're consuming, what kind of nutrition they're getting, how much fluid they're getting, how many calories they're getting, how much fat, all, how much sodium, all of that is being tracked. And so that information, that allows them to make good choices on orbit, but uh, that information is also accessible uh, by the flight surgeons so they can counsel them if they find that they are not getting enough or they're getting too much of something and not enough of something else. They can actually use the information from that app. Um, to counsel them real time. So I was just wondering, we had uh, MREs that we were giving out after Hurricane Ike here in Clear Lake, and I noticed the boxes did not have any kind of an expiration date on it. How long do you think the conventional MREs in stored in say room temperature ambient environment are safe to eat? Safe to eat? Pretty much yeah, forever. Same. Pretty much forever. <laughs> okay. So I will. I can tell you that when the first war in Iraq came along, they sent stuff over there that was like nine years old out of their storehouses. So uh, they MREs will last a very very long time. But again, chemical changes will occur, and so the quality does degrade. Now, how often? They routinely trade those out now. They probably don't, you know, now that since we have troops deployed pretty much constantly, uh, they probably don't have a lot of it sitting around for a really long time. But those products can last a very, very, very long time. Okay, thank you. Now, you mentioned the uh, vitamin C is one thing inside of uh, foods that degrades and it's better in the powder. Um, what are some other nutrients that you have challenges with making sure the astronauts get enough of our, that are preserved um, for a longer period of time? Actually, vitamin C is the one that has been that we were most concerned about. 
uh, what we found um, so far with the some with particular, we haven't looked at all nutrients yet. Uh, we've looked at specific ones, and the ones that we've looked at so far, vitamin C was the one that was mostly a problem. The others, we found that there was at least some products in our menu in which those nutrients were stable, uh, and so we didn't have as, as much of a concern uh, with those particular, uh, with other ones that we've looked at. So vitamin C was the biggest thing. That's interesting. Oh, and also uh, Stephen put a, a um, question in the chat room. It says, um, I thought breads were not allowed due to generation of crumbs. Um, how was this fixed? Okay, so when I came to work there, we were routinely sending sliced bread to orbit for them to make sandwiches. Um, yes, bread creates crumbs, but the crew members were adamant that they would deal with those crumbs in order to be able to make sandwiches on orbit. But as soon as they saw uh, how tortillas worked in orbit, they were like, okay, we'll switch to tortillas because they're much easier. Um, I mean, even some of the products that we send now uh, will create crumbs. You can't totally get away from that. But the crew members do have ways to, you know, they learn how to manage those crumbs on orbit. We have eliminated products over the years that created a lot of crumbs. Um, one of the funny stories I can remember is when Pringles first came out in cans, um, crew members wanted to take those small little short cans of Pringles because we had never sent potato chips to orbit because they, in the bags, they would just, they would be just a mess, but they wouldn't make it there. They would be destroyed by the time they got there. So when those cans came out, they wanted to take, yeah, I want to, I want to try taking chips to orbit. And we would like caution them. We're like, you know, even though it's in a can, it's going to be in better condition than it, a chip would be in a bag, but there's still going to be a lot of crumbs. And, but, you know, they were adamant. And so we did send some to orbit and the crew members came back and they're like, uh, we should have listened to you. That was the biggest mess. I would never take that again. And so word got around pretty quickly that that wasn't a real good idea. Um, I yeah. seem to remember Bart Simpson um, kind of illustrating that point in one of the Simpson comments. Uh, with uh, he's like eating uh, uh, chips in space and the crumbs are going every place. So yep. <laughs> um, are there any uh, tests that are routinely routinely done on astronauts to assess uh, what nutrients they might be um, short of and kind of adjusting their um, diets on an ongoing basis? Um. Yes. So uh, at Johnson Space Center is a group called the Nutritional Biochemistry Lab. And the NBL is responsible for doing the research on nutritional requirements for astronauts in microgravity. But one of the other tasks that they perform is they do pre-flight nutritional assessments on the crew members. So um, that, of course, is all private medical data but they meet with the crew members, they perform, um, they do certain tests on them, and if they see that there are nutritional things that could be improved for these crew members prior to flight, then they're going to counsel them. And any crew member who has the desire uh, can actually go to the folks in the NBL and ask for nutritional counseling. So they have a, a they have registered dietitians and nutrition scientists um, on their staff. And so they can counsel the crew members, um, answer their nutritional questions. And again, they do the pre-flight assessment to try to get them um, to beef, beef up their nutrition prior to flight, if, if needed. Most of these crew members, in order to fly into space, you have to be very, very healthy. 
if you can't pass all the medical stuff, then you're going to be grounded. And so these crew members, when they're active astronauts, they are exceedingly, most of them are exceedingly conscious of eating correctly because they want to maintain their health and maintain their ability to fly into space. This is John. Um, Vicki, in the next 20 years, what would you like to see in uh, food preparation in terms of innovation? For space or for the ground? Um, for space. For space. Well, um, I would like to them to be able to grow larger amounts of uh, these pick and eat crops. Uh, I think those are hugely important from a psychological perspective. So if we're going to have uh, if we're going to have habitats on the moon, habitats on Mars, I think uh, one of the important parts of that would be to include uh, the ability to grow crops. And fortunately, and and fortunately, those crops can also help with air and water recycling in those habitats. Uh, NASA has done several ground-based studies over the years looking at how plants can help uh, recycle air and water in closed habitats. Um, and so that would be something uh, when you know when we get to the point where if we have a habitation. Um, on the moon or Mars to be able to grow more of those pick and eat crops or even potentially grow something like wheat that you would actually have to mill. Uh, if you've got partial gravity, you can do that. Uh, milling wheat uh, in space in microgravity, uh, not worth the trouble because that would be just an uncontrollable mess. But once you have gravity involved, you can go beyond just pick and eat crops and potentially grow some things that might actually have to be processed prior to consumption. But that I think would be a really good addition because I can remember when we first started, uh, when we had uh, Veggie first go uh, to space and they were in on the space station they were first growing crops because the Russians actually grew some crops for science um, before we were growing stuff on station and I can remember the crew members saying that they thought the greenery growing was great because it was something that changed in the environment because so much around them did not change at all and so it was nice to see things grow uh, and change color and mature. Uh, so psychologically, they thought that was very important. Vicky, so, then, uh, so then in the movie, The Martian, the botanist, the astronaut botanist growing food on Mars, that was realistic. Once you have infrastructure, yes, but not for like your first mission to Mars when you don't have established infrastructure, that's probably not going to be realistic. Um, because it takes an awful lot of infrastructure to be able to grow crops and process them and into an edible uh, commodity. Vicki, are you familiar with the company Grow Mars that uh, is working on different techniques for actually growing food for Mars and also looking at lunar? techniques at commercial small commercial companies. I am somewhat familiar not extensively familiar but yeah. Daniel Tom's Tompkins uh, presented on the commercial space weekly telecon from NASA Ames a couple of months yeah, ago or Ames, so on that Ames and and Kennedy is doing a lot of the plant work um, Johnson used to do plant work but not as much now they really don't that's all done mostly in Florida and some at Ames. There's, there's some interesting things going on with uh, like having shipping containers configured for growing food and being used in terrestrial applications, but also developing the technology to do this on Mars or on the moon. Okay. I'll have to read up more on that.
Well, uh, Vicky, um, in terms of what's going on in, in uh, preparing food for space, um, have you seen any applications in terms of, you know, kind of regular um, preparation of food for people here on Earth? Any um, technology transfers that might be cool to highlight? Well, two, two emerging food processing technologies that have potential for space food systems as well as for Earth-based food systems. Um, the military is heavily researching and academia is as well, and NASA has partnered in this research as well. Uh, one is called high pressure processing. So high pressure processing, so when you process, when you process a can or a pouch in a retort, you're using a lot of heat and a little bit of pressure to kill the bacteria inside that can or that pouch. Um, high pressure processing flips that equation where you're using a lot less heat and you use a lot more pressure to kill the bacteria in, so in the food product. So uh, there are high pressure process products on the commercial market right now, but those products have only been processed to, um, to a level of what we call pasteurization, meaning the high pressure has been used to kill, uh, to kill pathogenic bacteria, but the products still have to be refrigerated after they have been processed. So some of the examples of those, you can like, in a, in a normal time, you can go to the grocery store and you can buy juices that have been high pressure processed. And you can buy, um, for instance, you can buy guacamole that has been high pressure processed. So the advantage of high pressure processing is by using less heat, you, um, you start, you have a higher nutritional content and higher quality in the finished product. Now the challenge is to high pressure process to a level of shelf stability so that you can, if you high pressure process, you won't need refrigeration. So that is something that is not on the commercial market right now and is under research. But there are a lot of challenges with that. Um, mainly um, the uh, equipment and how to make high pressure processing for the commercial market, you would need it to be a large scale process that could be done like food plants, everything's automated and, and done in large quantities and at high speed. Uh, so one of the challenges with high pressure processing is they haven't really figured out how to do that yet. So high pressure processing is a technology that's under research. And another one is something called microwave sterilization. So again, microwave sterilization would, it would use the same degree of heat in order to achieve commercial sterility. It would still use high heat but it would use it over a much shorter period of time. And so by shortening the time that the food is exposed to this high heat, you in theory end up with a higher quality product. And so that product will have a longer shelf life because if you start with a higher nutritional content, better color, better flavor, better texture, even though the chemical changes will still occur because you're starting at a higher point, you get a longer shelf life before you reach a point where the food is either unacceptable due to quality or unacceptable due to lack of nutrition. Um, so both of those are emerging technologies because um, in, in a retort, um, the heat, the product is exposed to heat for a long period of time. And so, and it, it's high heat for a very long period of time. And so that uh, causes a lower quality and a lower nutritional content. So both of those technologies have promises, uh, but they're still being researched. How high a pressure does, does that process use? 
You know, I can't really quote you numbers on that. I'd have to look that up. I don't know those off the top of my head. Okay. Um, any other questions that people might have? I have a I have a question, Vicky. First of all, thank you. This was excellent. Um, I I love the, your talk. You have so much information. Very very interesting job career that you've had. One of my questions, or my question, is regarding the irradiated food. Is are there any negative health ramifications from eating food that has been irradiated? No. Uh, there is no no evidence, no scientific evidence whatsoever that these products have any health issues whatsoever. Thank you. Um, Vicki, if you had the ability to actually mix things in space besides just adding hot water, would that open up a significant amount of options in terms of what could be prepared or... Um, Uh, well, potentially. I mean, it would make it easier for crew members to do things like, um, you know, add sugar to their coffee or add creamer or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, again, preparation-wise, the biggest goal that we've always been given is that we want to minimize the amount of time that crew members have to spend dealing with food. Uh, and the crew members, most of the, you know, most of them feel that way as well. They don't want to have to spend a whole lot of time preparing or cleaning up from uh, dining. They want to be able to um, spend their time more what they consider more productively. Oh. It's just difficult in microgravity to be able to deal with mixing or anything that's loose or open in an open container. It's difficult to deal with in microgravity. Well, uh, Vicki, uh, we really appreciate you coming and sharing all this wonderful information with us. Uh, it's, it's really amazing what goes into uh, feeding our astronauts and um, and kind of like the extent to which food can be made to last for long periods of time. It almost feels like we should have like a national uh, stockpile of food just in case uh, we have some type of crop failure or disaster or something, you know, just like we do for oil and uh, hopefully for other things too. So it's really, it's really funny because uh, I am on the IFT board of directors and we just had a board meeting. It was supposed to be in mid-March in Chicago and obviously that didn't happen. We did it remotely. But one of the guys on our board, a um, mid-level manager for Cargill Foods, which is a huge food company, and uh, he said uh, he was joking because, you know, nowadays he said, well, processed foods kind of have a bad rep with a lot of people, you know, because they're not fresh. Uh, they have they have uh, preservatives in them. And and he said, you know, the one thing about this whole coronavirus thing is preservatives are looking a whole lot better. <laughs> because you need you need that shelf stable food right now. Um, one thing I'd like to do uh, before uh, we go into kind of like an open discussion and, and maybe uh, end the meeting is uh, anybody who wants to turn on the webcam, I'd like to uh, take a group picture um, real quick. So if uh, anybody uh, wanted to turn on their camera and hasn't done so yet, just let me know. Looks like we have a few more people. Cool. And I, I think that may be it. So I'll just go ahead and every smile. Oh, uh, hold on a second. Screen capture software. Okay, cool. Well, 
Um, thank you all very much. Uh, did anybody else have any other topics that they wanted to discuss? Um, any big plans for coping with uh, our, our uh, uh, definitely another month in quarantine? Hey, hi, my name's Jack and um, I'm a friend of Dave Chevron's and he invited me to this uh, meeting uh, for a couple of reasons. So I, I just want to thank him and thank this group for this, this wonderful talk. Uh, I've actually known Dave since the Freedom Days back in the early 90s. And Dave and I are, are instrumental in doing the space element design competitions for high school students all across the planet. And um, one of the things that we're faced with right now is trying to figure out a virtual platform that we can use to do our competitions. And this particular activity today is an example of, of how people can interact virtually and still maintain um, meeting opportunities and interlog, interactive dialogues and those sorts of things. So I'd, I'd like to thank this group very much for the opportunity to do that. Um, and Vicki, I actually did uh, visit your lab a number of years ago. I'm, I'm a systems engineer at Boeing, and I've been doing space flight, uh, human space flight programs since 1982. And I'm currently working on the commercial crew program, and we, Boeing is also using, or it's also pursuing uh, moon initiatives that, that NASA is offering. So, uh, Greg, I think you'd mentioned earlier that Boeing was not doing those things. They are. Um, I can't talk a whole lot about that, but I'm sure if you wanted to get more information, you could contact the Boeing Public Affairs Office, and they could give you the, the public information that's available. But anyway, I just wanted to thank this group for the opportunity to hear this conversation and engage with y'all. And uh, again, let's just keep it going. Appreciate it. Uh, Dave and I, like I said, we're, we're very interested in, in long-term plans for doing uh, space settlements. And uh, Vicki, you, you gave some very interesting ideas that I think we can uh, uh, torture kids with. So <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'll give you all back to your, uh, to your conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I also used to work in Building 17, and uh, I found it really interesting when doing the, uh, the, the food sampling there that texture was one of the items that was to be evaluated. I wouldn't have necessarily expected texture to be on the list, but it's funny because my wife always thought I was just nuts because I didn't like certain foods because of the texture. So your, your, your evaluation forms helped me a lot with convincing my wife that yes, textures is, is, uh, is a factor in it. <laughs> but uh, any, any other comments you may have about how much people actually you know, like or dislike a food because of its texture, I'd be interested to hear. Well, um, can y'all guys still hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so texture, the, one of the reasons that, I mean, texture is very important to a lot of people with food. And it's especially important in space food because a very crunch in our diet uh, in the foods that we're able to send into space. Because when you freeze dry and then rehydrate products, um, they're going to tend to be soft. Um, so uh, it really helps us to try to find stuff that can add a little crunch. So things like nuts and things like that are very important uh, to a lot of the crew members because there is so little crunch in our in our menu. Yeah, I just thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Vicki, you don't anticipate a food shortage during the coronavirus, do you? No, so actually uh, NASA centers, Johnson Space Center is at what they call stage three. So only um, essential personnel are allowed on site right now, but the technicians, not the managers, <laughs> the technicians in our food lab are considered essential personnel. So food packaging and processing is still going on at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, but if I were still working there, I would not be allowed on site right now because I was not a hands-on person. I would be working remotely and my uh, replacement is indeed working remotely right now. So uh, no, that's a, that is something that still has to go on because 
uh, cargo flights are going to launch, and so we have to be pre they have to be prepared to ship cargo to uh, go on those vehicles. Thank you. Well, very good. Um, thank you again, uh, Vicky, uh, for coming and and talking to us. And you're welcome. Uh, um, hopefully, some maybe next year you you come and uh, we <laughs> actually do this in person. And, <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're still on target to have our May meeting. It'll be uh, done virtually. And I hope everybody can come back uh, to our May meeting. And uh, I'll send out the details on the email and the website. And uh, I think, uh, did anybody have any last topics that they wanted to bring up before we uh, end the recording and, and close out the meeting? Hey, Nathan, it'd be nice if when you get the, the physical real world meetings going, if you could uh, include an option to tie in remote links a whole lot nicer than having to drive an hour and a half up there from Clear Lake. Well, we'll definitely explore that um, further and, and we'll get to do so uh, with like some actual experience on, on what that would be like. That's an well, it worked, worked That's real well, idea. I think. Yeah, I, I like that idea, Dave, because um, I have nephews that might be interested in, they're, they're very interested in the space program, but they live in Oregon. So maybe they could join in sometime. That would that would be interesting. Hey, Nathan, I have a question. How many people are actually logged into this meeting? I, I see, I think, seven on my screen. Um, the highest was 22. Uh, it's currently at 15. OK, because maybe it's me and the Zoom application. But I, I can't scroll through the membership to see who's here and who's logged in. And I, I guess I'll have to get with David offline on that because that's one of the features that I think we're trying to understand to do the virtual competitions that we're going to be doing. Uh, Jack, there should be Jack, there should be a uh, button if you go to the same menu where you show the mute and unmute that says participants, and it should if you touch that one, it should. Oh, okay, yeah. Rolling up and 15. down, you should have the full list, and yeah, you can see 15. who's talking. If you look at the green indicator on the mic, you see. Yeah, I, I got that part. I definitely got that part. Okay. So but uh, you should have everybody there. Yeah, yeah, I do, but I just don't see all the videos. Maybe, maybe there's only six videos or seven videos. Yeah, there's I don't also, think everybody. Yeah, there's also yeah. a little on my screen on the gallery view. There's a little arrow, so I only see six people. But then, if I'm looking at like Dave's picture, there's a little arrow, and you hit that arrow, and the rest of the videos or people will come up. So there's like yeah. a toggle switch. You've got to go back and forth. And if you look carefully where the microphone is showing the green, Jack, you'll see that the video cameras are red and X or crossed out on most participants. Yes, or I see Not that. most, but a lot of them. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's some of the things we're going to have to help explain to our, our competitors. Um, yeah. So it'll be interesting. We've never done this. We've, uh, we've done all our competitions in, in person. And they've always been a challenge in the, to get together with logistics and so forth and the volunteers. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, nope. been, I don't know if Dave's um, talked to you all about what we do, but it's, it's an amazing um, thing we've done with high school students all across the planet. And much of what you're talking about here today are things that, that we feed forward into a fewer futuristic view, uh, like, like growing your own plants. You know, we expect the students to have farms. And uh, so... Yeah, so Jack, just to interrupt real quick, but uh, Anita and I went up to uh, the North Houston location and Anita gave a presentation back, I think, before, just before we went to India last year to the chapter. Okay. So we could, you know, maybe we can invite uh, Nathan or a few members to see if they want to help support the, the virtual uh, uh, that would be That would be fantastic. There's folks on this call that would like to participate virtually in our competition and like Dave said, the dates are the 18th to the 26th. And Dave, like I said, I'm going to be sending out an email to volunteers. If you want to shoot me some emails from folks here, then I'll certainly invite them. And if they'd like to participate as first time volunteers, we'll, we'll be happy to have them. Yeah, Nathan, you want me to just send Jack your address and then yeah. he can include you on that? Yeah, that'd be best. Uh, what I can do is uh, send out information about that in, in an email this week with the summary of this meeting as well. And um, we 
might have uh, more volunteers than uh, you know what to do with. So Well, I, I get into a feast or famine situation every time. And uh, oddly enough, it seems to work out. But we try to bring volunteers in the first time uh, in, in less um, important roles, if you will. So they don't, they're not encumbered by trying to understand the mechanics of the competition. And we give them a, them a chance to see how it works, get their feet wet, that sort of thing. Um, well, the thing is, thing is with this, it's easy to just invite somebody to kind of just tie in and, and watch what's going on. Yeah, we, we may do that. Um, we may need to talk internally about that particular participation level. We've never really had that, but yeah, that might be well, something. Well, well we, we do sometimes. That's how Rick Janae came out the first time. He was yeah, invited yeah. to come and just kind of observe. We really don't know how this is going to work, <laughs> but we'll find out. Well, Nathan, you are recording this, aren't you? I am. Okay, hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Ethan, thank you. It was, it was very good, uh, very good speaker. Thank you. Well, it sounds good. I think uh, we'll we'll end it here. And uh, the virtual uh, meeting uh, definitely is a whole another aspect to explore. Um, being able to include people that are geographically separated and uh, also uh, it's a little bit more efficient in terms of uh, time too for a lot of people. So. Um, We'll definitely have to do more with it. But uh, thank you again for coming. And uh, hopefully uh, all of y'all could come to our, our May meeting. Hopefully. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you again, Big Drink. Uh-huh. Y'all have a good day. Thanks. Stay safe. Hey, bye. Thank you.